Fab. So hello to everybody watching. Um, this is going to be a super exciting, interesting talk today with Emily from Lighten Up Dog Training. Um, so we're going to be talking about something which is, uh, should we say, a controversial topic in dog training at the moment. Um, but it's something that we both feel quite strongly about and about educating people for. So we're going to be talking about breed specific behaviors. Um, and breed specific outlets, the pros and cons. Um, but before we dig into that, Emma, would you like to um, just give a little overview on who you are, what you do, who you work with? Yeah, so I help guardians and trainers who are working with the dogs who have all the big feelings, whether it's fear and anxiety related, whether it's frustration, and also dogs who struggle with impulsivity as well. And so I work, as you can imagine, a lot with different working breeds. So with working cockers, uh, working Brittany Spaniels, um, setters from time to time, and lots of shepherds and the occasional collie. <laughs> right. Fantastic. And of course, they just do the collies. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously, this is where it's come up for me, because um, uh, for the last few years, I've just worked with border collies. So that's given me a huge number um, to watch, observe and, uh, you know, notice the problems that people have with them um, and view their training from that breed specific lens. Um, and of course, I was listening to your talk the other day on frustration and you mentioned a snippet of something which I'd just been writing a blog about, um, about breed specific outlets. Um, so over recent, is it really the last handful of years, isn't it, that this has been talked about more so and look at the breed that you've got, what they were bred to do. Um, and certainly in terms of border collies, there's been a lot of herding type games that have um, been brought up. And one of my frustrations is that what I see with border collies is that if they've got unwanted behavior that is driven by their instinct, and then people say, oh, well, it's because they haven't got that outlet for their breed specific needs. So people go and do the herding game or tribal, or there's a whole host of different herding type activities now, supposedly to meet the dog's needs. However, their guardians are usually doing a really good job at meeting their needs in other ways, but then they're accentuating and igniting that herding instinct even more, which then makes the unwanted behavior which is driven by that even bigger. So rather than actually solving the problem, it's actually making it worse. So we're gonna dig into this a bit because I always feel that I'm going against the grain a little bit when I'm saying actually, no, I wouldn't be doing that with your dog at this point in time. Um, and so it was joy to my ears to hear you talking about something similar the other day um, in relation to frustration. So would you like to um, talk a little bit about how you've seen this happening as well? Yeah, I think so. And I know exactly what you mean about pushing against the grain because it's it's very popular. I think the one thing that always gets me is when I heard the word drive. It's just a real button for me um, because... I guess because I've got such a psychological background, I'm coming at it that drive theory and psychology has its space very much in physiology. So it's relating to oxygen and water and food and sex and other icky things we don't like to talk about. But it's very much a biological need. And for me, part of the problem is when we see it as a biological need, as if it's building up, building up, building up. And the only way that we can release that is through um, some kind of release valve. And, and so I'm kind of like, OK, well, that's true of drinking but I'm not sure it's necessarily fitting when we're talking about intrinsic motivation. So that's my problem is that when we're, uh, I don't mind the word driving, I use it all the time in, in what I'm saying, because people understand it and it's a shortcut, but I think it leads us to think of outlets. And I think that's for me, um, sometimes useful and sometimes less useful kind of terminology, because I think it just leads to very simplistic thinking, which is a big problem, isn't it, for human beings? We like things in black and white and to be simple. But where we're thinking of it as being urges and, re and releases or drives and outlets, then I think it 
and especially when we get so fixed on breed specifics that we forget that actually we've got a we've got an individual dog in front of us with individual likes and i've owned three mallies now every single one of them has looked different from each other and every single one of them has behaved differently from each other and 95 percent of what they did was dog um and a very small bit of it and probably the problematic bit of it was malinois <laughs> um and some of the things that i was seeing that connect the three well was that to do with them being in a shelter and being flicker one of my mallies have been rehomed seven times and separation related behaviors was the big reason but all three of them have had separation related behaviors so is that more is that more about what it means to be a mally i don't know and i think we're at the beginning of that journey um, but I don't like taking a simplistic understanding of things where we're talking about drive as being some kind of biological um, need um, with a particular outlet. And therefore, our dogs must do what they've been bred for um, yeah. because it's too simplistic, isn't it, to see things like that? Yeah. Um, what I quite often see is um, a Border Collie inappropriately herding. So mm. with, in not a social way. So either they might be trying to herd moving vehicles or cyclists or joggers, <laughs> children in the house or family members. Mm -hmm. And then people say, oh, they should be herding something instead. Yeah. So then they take them out and they do some herding type activity with them. Yeah. Expecting that to change the behavior, which is in a different Everything environment, else. a different context, and it's totally different. So the dog goes out and really enjoys, <clears throat> excuse mm -hmm. me, the activity that they're doing, but it's not going to change them and stop them herding the children in the house or chasing cars on the lead on the way home from the park where they've done this um, activity. So also, um, I keep coming back to the fact that, believe it or not, farmers and shepherds will train their dogs before they put them on sheep. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> not a case of taking your dog that hasn't got basic training and doing herding activities with them to solve and meet all of their needs so um there are thousands of border collies in the world that participate in agility and obedience and all different types of sports activities never do any type of herding activity and are totally satisfied um mm -hmm. and i think that you know we need to consider that yeah um, I think uh, for me there's kind of three things so what you said about uh, that's I think you've helped me clarify why I don't like it being referred to as a drive uh, because drive it Clive um Hall's theory was drive reduction um and the idea that you do it and it reduces your drive. And what I'm seeing is actually, no, a lot of the dogs end up just fatigued. So that's the only reason that they stop is because the muscles say no more. And um, rather than that need has been met. And so as soon as they're not fatigued anymore. So that's one problem that we see it with the drive and it leads us naturally to think of drive reduction. Whereas that's not what's happening. It's actually a lot of the time is very reinforcing to the dog to do this thing that they've been bred to do anyway. So that's one thing. And it reminds me because I have spent a lot of my dog career in France around, I don't know, old guys in the countryside who are using dogs. We don't have a lot of sheep, but we do have dog, people who collect cows with dogs. And, and so uh, we've got the ubiquitous Mali is great for that because they're, they're what we call in France polyvalent. So they're multi-talented. They can do a bit of herding. They can do a bit of protection. Whatever it is you want them to do, they can do a bit of it. And uh, and that's great. They're adaptable dogs. But they don't use a lot of rewards and they don't use a lot of punishers because they understand something that I think you and I really understand, which is that when you've got intrinsic motivation, reinforcement and punishment isn't necessary and we're not talking about the same thing so if we're not talking about drive and being able to reduce it by practicing these behaviors we're actually just making it more and also we need to understand that intrinsic motivation we need to the the word that a lot of the old french guys use is canalise it's like to channel the dog that you you kind of setting him in a groove and teaching them all the things we talk about all the time, like off switches and how to relax and so on. But you you polish it, you're sanding the edges. So what you've got is like a, a block of marble and then you're kind of sanding the edges to make this kind of thing out of it afterwards. So I think that's kind of like my take on things. Working with a lot of people who do work with dogs quite a lot and gun dogs and um, 
you know, all kinds, of, every type of working dog that there could possibly be, you've got in rural France. So people use dogs for all kinds of utilities. And it really is that that channeling of, of those instincts um, in a much more, I don't know, in a very different way than the kind of the way I've seen in dog training, maybe. Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, it's for our dog training, the just the general dog training, we tend to take the easy route. We use food or toys. Yeah. And we can't work out why the environment is so rewarding to our dog. Whereas we yeah. can also use the environment to um, be rewarding for our dog. Um, but with a shepherd, a farmer, with their livestock, they're the gateway to what the dog wants. Yes. And what the dog wants is to be allowed to control the livestock. But if the person that they work with, and this is why they're so good at working with people, gives them access to that for good behavior, then yeah. they just keep going and keep going and keep going. Absolutely. Yeah. And the only time that they will stop is when they're fatigued. And that's why we've got to do that important bit about putting the, uh, the stop button in and it reminds me I think we've kind of gone down the 1940s whole drive theory and drive reduction theory where we're talking about breed specific behaviors um, and trying to put it into the predatory motor sequence and so on uh, which is part I think oh, it's obviously part of the solution but um, Dr Simone Gadbois, um did some comments recently on a blog that Lucas um, Brand had written about predatory motor behaviour and it really tied in with some research I was doing myself at the time about Kent Berridge's work so Kent Berridge works mainly in the field of addiction uh, and addiction studies and he's, he doesn't call it like, I know many of us are familiar with Panksep and the seeking, um, you know, when we've got all of this kind of like approach behaviors, or we might want to see it as kind of like part of the predatory motor sequence. We might want to see it as like, um, we've got all of those theories, but I don't think we're paying enough mind to. So he categorizes things as wanting behaviors and liking behaviors, which I do think is very bad use of words because um, it doesn't really clarify what they mean. So basically the wanting behaviors are the appetitive behaviors, the doing the thing. Because when you're thinking about a collie, they're not doing it to get all the sheep in a little space, are they? they? They wouldn't stop if that was the end. They'd like go and find some more to do. So they're not goal driven behaviors. They're behaviors that the dog does for the love of doing the behavior. Um, and I think when we see that, then we start to understand when we're looking at the wanting as that as a wanting behavior that the dog is doing it because they just love doing the thing um so a cocker is going to love flushing things out and going into dark bushes and and moving and wiggling and so on um and i get the mallies which can be a bit of all kinds of different things and you get with the collies who they they want to be in motion they want to be doing the thing and when the kind of it's tidied up, then it's a little bit frustrating in lots of ways um, because it's never about the goal. It's not about the behavior in itself. It's about being, you know, doing those things. And yeah. I think that for me is a better explanation. And I don't like the parallel between these behaviors being addictive because that's not what I'm trying to say. It's not why I'm kind of mentioning Kent Berridge, but Simone Gabbois picked that up as well. That these are dogs that just like doing the thing that they were bred to do. Yeah. Um, and if we don't help them channel that need, then what we get are dogs, because that's it's such a big field. And I'm so in love with it um, about um, about addiction, how we're always kind of chasing. It's never as good as the first time. <laughs> so you're always seeking to do more and more and more. Um, and we habituate to doing it as well. So it's not giving us the same thrill. Um, and also we end up putting all of our kind of like all, uh, all of the good stuff that it brings to us biologically speaking we all it's like we're putting all of our eggs into one basket that there's only one thing that really meets that hit and so that in itself then becomes a problem because the, the dog's like no I'm not going to do anything else because I only want the only thing that brings me any satisfaction whatsoever is doing this yeah um this and is that kind of, in itself is tough 
Yeah, and this is where I see with, um, so a fair number of border collies may be seen or labeled as being reactive to other dogs. And there's lots of different reasons why that might be. Um, so a lot of people label them as fearful, but there's also a fair big chunk of them that are actually movement sensitive and they're not fearful of the dogs, no. but they see a dog moving and they react because it doesn't matter what's moving. They want to control it. And then that then, if they're obviously on the lead, here's your field of frustration. Um, yeah. They're labeled as being reactive and they must be fearful. But actually, they're getting a kick out of it because yeah. it's been so hardwired into controlled, yeah. movement, controlled movement. So then they're given outlets breed specific outlets um which i've not out, seen that reduction uh, they're bringing out the eye even more to stare mm -hmm. at something even more and control something even more and then they may well and this is um where people may think it's working they will probably be able to do that in a whole load of dogs because they'll stay totally focused on the job at hand mm -hmm. which is yeah. the herding type game but that doesn't make them less reactive in the yeah. Because it's only when they're doing it. Yeah. That's because if, if genuinely they were fearful, yeah. they need to engage with the things that they are fearful of. And a lot of fearful dogs avoid the problem. And so that in itself is reinforcing. Um, the No, that's a bad term. It, it's recreating that uh, that cycle because they're avoiding so they're not engaging they're not giving their big brain time to kind of like say no you this is not anything to be scared of and so we get a lot of that with anxious um people and anxious mammals is that they won't uh, they won't engage until the last minute with things they are fearful so doing those kind of things around other dogs isn't actually helping them because when they don't have it it just becomes like um a crutch doesn't it that they're relying on that that thing that's heavily re reinforcing the behavior that's like doing the herding stuff or doing the agility yeah i'm absolutely fine when i'm in the ring i'm absolutely fine but i'm going to shout at everyone that's out of it and i think that's for lots of reasons and number one is that if they really were fearful of those dogs in any way then uh, they aren't actually giving themselves space to down regulate their feelings about it and realize that the other dogs aren't a threat they're just avoiding dealing with it whatsoever um so that's that's one aspect of that and the second is that when we take away one goal and then they, then they're just going to replace it with the need to do it on another and then do, do, so then it's like okay well i was doing this and now now what um so we get that side of things as well i think um so it just it just means that we need to take a cautious approach doesn't it and we need to put those off switches in before we put the on switches in in lots yeah, of ways absolutely and even the basic training you know obviously most farmers uh shepherds don't necessarily take their job loosely walking because they don't have to they're not in that environment but we have them in an urban environment and then we don't teach them that and then they're pulling on the lead and reacting and getting frustrated because they're on the lead um and the recall as well um, yeah. is really important as basic training. So mostly for me, for the Border Collies, get those foundations in place before. And if you, if you have a dog that you have control over in those situations, yes, doing herding type games can be a fun thing to do with your dog. Which uh, that brings me back to another thing. So mostly we're not going to experience these problems. Are we? Most dogs are normal, fall in that normal spectrum. But you and I, we both live with dogs who lived outside that normal sphere. And it reminds me of something Dr. Karen Overall says. So she's the behavior uh, veterinary behaviorist in America who's like really very well known, incredibly talented. And she said she sometimes wonders, she hadn't got any research on this, but she wonders in creating responsive training, trainable highly motivated dogs whether sometimes we overshot the mark and I'm totally with that because you know I don't think there is a line of dogs who've been selected for work behaviors as much as a collie has been selected for work behaviors other than say some of the the scent hounds maybe in France so um, some of the scent hounds uh, sight hounds so some of those dogs have been selected for work behaviors but none of them in the same way as a collie because also the collie I love all of this you know I love all of this they 
what fascinates me is the unique populations of them, how the Lakeland ones are different than the than the lowland Scottish ones, who are different from the Welsh collies, because they're working in very different geographical environments with different sheep who have different responses to seeing a dog. So some of the ones in the lakes that some of my Lakeland friends um, use their dogs on, they, don't, they see a dog twice a year. So the dog comes and rounds them up and those sheep are hefted to the land. They are incredibly difficult to move. They don't want to move. There are rams in there as well. And they don't, they're like, no. Nope. So they need a different kind of personality to be able to work in that territory. Then say, for instance, because I love the continental herding. Of course I do. I've got shepherds. Um, and, and, we, and I accept that we're always going to be, we're not even in the top three rankings, are we, when it comes to herding? We can do it, but we're a bit crap. And that's why we have to have separate competition competitions in Europe for continental herders but what I notice about those is the sheep in Europe are moved every single day they're moved from one plot to another plot during the day and so in Belgium in in uh, Poland in Germany in France you'll have a small area a small number of sheep and they're so used to being moved they're so easy they're so docile and they, you don't have to have all of the harder behaviours that some of the collies have got to have um, and more challenging, you know. So I just love all of those things. But, and this brings me back to my point because I did have one, <laughs> that even in how many, we've known, I know for sure that John Keyes mentions collies in 1500s. If we're selecting those dogs then for those behaviours and we've had 500, 600 years more, we still get variability because genes never, they are great and heritability is wonderful, but it's never perfect. And I think that comes back to what Karen overall was saying, that sometimes you're going to get collies who are a bit like, uh, you know, even from a great litter with 600 years of heritage of, of Lakeland herding. And we're also going to get ones who, as Karen overall says, sh overshot the mark. Yeah. And sometimes those are the ones that we're getting for all kinds of reasons, because genetics is going to do that to us. It's going to give us ones who've got superpowers, as well as it's going to give us ones who are a bit more mundane, a bit more average. Yeah. So, and I think, you know, that that's why I can look at stuff and I can think, oh, this will be great if you had a normal dog. Um, and yeah, a little bit of a sniffari and some of this and a little bit of this and a little bit of that, because those dogs don't become obsessive about things because we haven't overshot the mark with those in terms of work behaviors. Um, and so then we get the we get to live with the ones who have overshot the mark and and uh, yeah, uh, are, are very highly motivated from intrinsic drive to move to do the things that they're you know that they've been selected to do for all of those years um, and it's it's quite often those positive traits that they've been bred for mm -hmm. that make them excel in sport but also can get them into trouble in Absolutely. the environment so yeah. is it more that we should be looking more about you know the environment that we've got them in yeah I think so and you know I say I always say frustration is the dark side of motivation and impulsivity is the dark side of trainability so whenever I see a frustrated impulsive dog which are often my working breeds I, I now get to think well that's really good they're very highly motivated and they're also really trainable yeah. um but you know there are one or two that are complete outliers and 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 even that isn't true of them but generally speaking it's true but yeah. i think we forget as well um that collies um like i think about the difference between shepherds shepherds are shepherd dogs they're the dogs that belong to the shepherd they're a tool for the shepherd whereas a collie got a mind of its own yeah. And so they like to think of maybe more creative solutions to things or less likely to, you know, you, you can have a bloke standing at, down at the bottom of the hill going, there's another one up there, go by, you yeah. know, or whatever it is that they say. Um, whereas dogs are going to work differently depending on their relationship to us. And I think that's an important thing, isn't it, about all the working dogs that we work with who I get or the ones that have got fizzy behaviours that sometimes turn into spiky behaviours are gun dogs, herding dogs or multi-purpose continental herders um, who are all supposed to work with a person. Um, and we forget sometimes that that's our job is to be the brakes sometimes for those dogs 
and yeah. to make the decisions for them. And yeah. sometimes we put all of that onto the dog because we, it, I think it's a fault, isn't it? Of, uh, particularly the UK, the US, we've got this very individualistic, we forget that we're members of a society and a social system. Um, and we talk about families as well. And it's not that necessarily because that's not the only way that social beings interact with one another. And so I think sometimes that we forget that, well, the things that my dog is maybe lacking, like in self-control sometimes, that's my job to be the brakes because they can't necessarily. Um, still so for, um, <laughs> for modern dog training in the, let's face it, it has improved a lot over the years. I'm not oh, knocking okay. modern dog training, but we've almost gone on a pendulum and swung so far that they're the individual yeah and so now we're about giving them choices but we're now giving them sometimes inappropriate too many choices but yeah. the choice where they can make the wrong choice so yeah. don't get me wrong I still give my dogs choices but it might be which of these two toys do you want to play with today yep. and there's so much science about that there's so yeah. much science yeah um, whereas if I give my dog my reactive dog the choice do you want to react or do you want to turn back to me yeah what's he going to do and then we get cross because they've reacted but they've made a choice yeah so it's, it, we need to really think about as we've already mentioned what motivates the dog so is yeah. it intrinsically motivating um yeah. is it extrinsically motivating how can we change that if it is intrinsically motivating how can we actually change that by harnessing what yes. our dog wants um, and it comes back to that channeling, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, and that 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 in lots of ways it's it's hard because we it, we we have to come to the conclusion that we can't give our dog complete free will. Um, and I think that's tough because we, you know, for, for many years dogs have suffered because they haven't had any choice whatsoever. Um, and now we realize because Barry Schwartz's work on choice paralysis is so big. Humans get choice paralysis. We've got great big brains that are designed to process choice. Um, and, you know, there's so much about choice paralysis in the 21st century that we're absolutely paralyzed by the fact that there's, you know, which iPhone model do I need to get? Which cereal brand am I going to buy? What job do I want to go into? And it just it, it, it evokes a stress response. Yeah. um yeah. and that in lots of ways so I was kind of thinking beyond the cho choice paralysis um certainly I find with impulsive dogs um when it comes to choices I always use a, some clips I, I'm not a big fan of football for reasons it's not a particularly interesting sport to me and that's fine um but there's a really, when we think of some of the top sports players who completely lost it, I can see a lot of parallels with our really high performing dogs. So I always use the example of Eric Cantona. So Eric Cantona, a bit like Flicker My Mally, had had six homes before he found Manchester United, which tells you a bit that he was struggling in the environments that he was in. When he found, found um, oh God, his name, Alex Ferguson, then he found his space. And we had that moment, so most of us are too young to remember, not me, um, that Eric Cantona was banned from playing football for eight months and had a small suspended sentence for kicking a fan in the face. So he got a red card and he was totally calm. He was totally calm. He got the red card and he was being sent off. There was a bit of remonstration from the other players on the pitch, but there were 22 other players. There was the referee on all the lines people and Eric um, and Alex Ferguson in the stand. No one saw that Eric Cantona was about to go off the, the pitch, see a fan run down, start swearing at him about French people and they're trying to kick him in the face. Um, and we see that with Zinedine Zidane. We see it with, um, I know um, John McEnroe is really famous for his temper explosions, that a lot of our really high performing sports players have got qualities that we often see in our, um, in our high performing working dogs. Mm -hmm. And what I loved about um, Eric Cantona is he uses um, a term when he's talking about um Alex Ferguson so not everybody liked Alex Ferguson's method of leadership or is often known as a hairdryer approach and just yell at people but Eric uses a very very French gesture that I'm not sure everybody understands and it's this 
and it looks like a little box and he talks about encadrement and it means the that coming back to the channeling and the boxing in and that's what er that Eric Cantona got out of Alex Ferguson and I think that's exactly the same link that our dogs get out of us that they're going to be floating around homeless and getting into trouble and getting into fights and being passed on and going on loans and never finding a home until they find that person who understands how to smooth the edges off them and how to direct them. But it brings me back to another one as well. The, the final thought about that is nobody saw it because if Alex Ferguson had seen, you know, if I lose my temper, you know, it's coming, I'm boiled and I'm mad and I'm raging and you can see it a million miles away. Nobody would come near me. My sister just goes, Emma, go home. Um, and nobody saw that coming. Nobody saw that in Zidane when he had butted that other player in, you know. Nobody saw that McEnroe was going to lose his temper. And we see that a lot with our dogs, who we sometimes, with fear, with anger, with with aggression, we're looking for a ladder of, uh, of behaviour, aren't we? We're looking for those smaller behaviours. And they go straight to big. Um, and that's that impulsivity as well that has come along for the ride sometimes with responsiveness, I think, which we don't always see until it's too late. So coming back to the dog stuff, I know I've placed dogs in homes where I've said, you need to be careful because this dog has got really, you know, and I'll use it, a really strong drive. They're really motivated to do stuff. They've sent me pictures during the day. Oh, look at my dog chasing birds all the day long. And I'm like, hmm. And then, oh, my dog's growled at me in the evening or my dog went up to bite me in the evening. Do you think they've got eyesight problems? And like, no, they just ran out of patience to be able to, they, they're fatigued from doing the things that they would do all the day anyway. They're fractious because they've got no self-control left and yeah. they needed more of that on cadrement from you. They needed that squaring off and you've yeah. not provided it for them because they've just had a free choice to be a you know do all the dog stuff that normal dogs would be able to do you know they don't get into headbutting fights and, and fall yeah. out with people a big long ranty waffle i know but i think that's why sometimes we're seeing the end of the spectrum aren't we yeah um, and that makes us know for sure that we're chasing the wrong thing when we're talking about um let's give them an outlet because actually all we're doing is stoking the fire we're not helping put that fire out yeah no, absolutely. And this is really common in border collies where they may go in the garden and bird chase or chase cars or people up and down the fence line, um, you know, and then I'm the meanie that comes along and says, don't let them out there without being on a yeah. line. Yes. And, and you see like the police. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's only for a period of time while you teach them yeah. what you want to do instead and how to manage themselves and alternative behaviors. But if we allow them to continue to do those things then it spills over into so many other um issues absolutely and i think a lot of those very highly driven dogs particularly when they have got highly motivated dogs i should say when they've got one thing that really floats their boat they really struggle when they can't do that one thing and that gives us the impression that it must be a, they must need an outlet for it rather yeah. than actually saying i think you need some more skills before we go and do that again yeah. And this is um, briefly to talk to you about my puppy before um, we came on. And, you know, she's massively intelligent um, and I teach them luring and shaping and how to learn as baby puppies. Um, but she will disengage very quickly after a couple of reps of one thing. Now, you could turn around and go, oh, well, she's she's not very bright. She doesn't know what I want. Actually, I think it's the other extreme in yeah. that she so bright that she's done it twice why why do I need to do that again I've done it already yeah um, so she needs to learn how to shape to work through those little bits of frustration absolutely there and is you've got the beautiful video with Ding where you're doing the frustration and you're working through his frustration and it's just a tiny little exercise tell me about that tell all the people about that Oh, which one? I've got so many of Ding with my children. You were doing, it, it was four, two front paws on. Were you doing like back end awareness and moving around? I think you were doing that. No. So he had his front paws on the platform and I think he was doing back end awareness, moving around in a circle. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, once I've taught them, obviously she's not at the stage to do more advanced stuff, but for him that was a more advanced thing. So two front paws on a um, bucket or you know a platform um, and then 
getting him to go around it with his front paws on, but so that he then has to turn his back to me. Um, yeah. He's pivoting around. Um, and so that's actually, I use that as one of the things in my frustration tolerance module in my academy. But what I find really interesting and my academy members watching this will all probably have a little chuckle is actually it creates as much frustration in the handlers as it does the dogs because their dog isn't doing the final activity, which actually that isn't why it's in there because it's about the dog learning and the dog going, okay, well, she's marking my back foot movement in that direction. Oh, okay, now she's marking two steps in that direction, but then having the confidence to actually turn away from me as they're doing it as well. Um, and I think it took, I can't remember now how many days it took me with like little short sessions for him to do it, maybe three days for him to complete a turn and build that confidence. But it's such a, um, a skill for them, but it's also a skill for the person because I, I then see the people moving to try and create the movement. And then the dogs then going, well, actually, you're going to now do the work. And the dog ends up shaping the handler rather than the handler shaping the dog. But we need to teach our dogs to actually think, to work yeah. things out, to keep trying um, rather than to disengage and to be able to cope with those small amounts of frustration. And I compare it a little bit with me with a computer. I can use a computer as long as it does the things that I know how to do. If it throws something random at me, or if I have to learn something new on the computer, I find it so frustrating. And so I don't want to sit down. I put it off. I'll walk away from it. I'll displace. I'll do all the <laughs> things I don't usually do, like cleaning. And um, <laughs> because I don't want to do it because I don't like it. But I might sit down and complete a task, which maybe takes me all day. The joy or the pleasure that you get out of doing that really difficult thing it's like, oh my God, I can do it. It That confidence that then builds. So next time you go, well, I, I managed to work this really difficult thing out. So therefore I can work this thing out. Mm. So then they stay engaged with you and they try a bit harder. And yeah. yeah. So um, Because it's really easy for them to shape us into doing the things that they find easy. Um, and I'm laughing because you just described that's I I've done that I've created I find this shepherds are different than collies because shepherds just like just tell me what to do and they'll do the 100% wrong bad thing that you don't want them to do and I always think um I was like I worked with a doberman who just would bark at anything that mildly irritated her and and that was her and and like move do things and, and she just she needed so much guidance that you couldn't do anything like auto shaping with her but and I always say that's often the thing that they need isn't it um you know so yeah. I love um Kamal's box activity just like you know you just need some free shaping just throw me some stuff out and what I've shaped in her and what she shaped in me she'll just sit and go right I just need more information and yeah. she really responds very well to targeting but what I need her to do is actually think for herself yeah. <laughs> and yeah. so and but it's really easy for me not to do those things and those I think are the skills the cognitive skills where they're actually reflecting on their body their movement what they're doing that are actually much more beneficial for the kind of dogs that really struggle than going out and, you know, doing some thing that we think is a breed specific. Because that's where I see the breed specific things. Because if you give a spaniel a box, they'll throw out so many behaviours, you'll click the wrong ones. They'll throw out 97 behaviours and they'll settle on one that suits them. And it's like, well, I don't want to do the one that you want to do. So that I, I just love it. There was a video um a friend of mine uh, who's a student on the frustration masterclass, she sent a video of her spaniel doing free shaping and it's like this, this, this. She picked up, she was uh, she she picked up a bottle, she threw the bottle on the floor. She'd done 14 behaviors before the trainer could even get a word in. Um, and compare that to a shepherd who would look at that and then go, Well, can you give me a clue? Yeah. Um, 
and and so those to me are actually more typical breed behaviors that i'm seeing as my spaniel shaped me into all kinds of things i was her butler i opened the door on her command she had a cue that told me to fill the water she <laughs> she would tell me that i'd left things on the mantelpiece that she wanted i was her grabby hand and Liddy just will sit and look at me like more information needed please before i clear on what we're doing yeah and i give it to her yeah which is the opposite of what she needs she yeah. needs me to like come on throw me out some other behaviors but she'll just sit there yeah like i don't know what we're doing i'm just gonna sit here for four hours um and then it becomes really difficult to shape her so we have to go back to beginnings yeah. so i think for me, those are type, more breed specific behaviors than, well, a cock is going to go into a bush and flush out some, you know, or retrieve a bird that you've shot down from the sky or whatever it is. Uh, to think more about those things as breed specific behaviors. And also to think about how they've been bred to actually work with us as a partnership. Because, um, you know, you're going to send your cocker and your collie off. You're going to keep your shepherd with them and tell them to do a job. Um, and and supervise them and they may supervise you back yes <laughs> but you're going to get that same they don't need you as the other dogs don't need you quite as much for instruction so yeah. those are really I think more fundamental things for me than saying ah oh, they need to do some herding and yeah um, and I think you know if you take a border collie out and do something like the herding game it's going to get it quite quickly so then yeah. it's doing it yeah. and it's, it's easy so it gives then the owner a little dopamine boost because they're doing something with their dog that and it's they've succeeded in teaching their dog to do it but then if they can't teach their dog to learn how to shape and how to um lure and how to have those basics in place you've still got the underlying problems of your unwanted behavior totally and it's that isn't it because we we do find it really easy to reinforce the things that they can naturally already do and that's the thing I always love to remind myself about about reinforcement training. We can only shape what's there naturally in the dog. We can't we can't reinforce climbing trees because yeah. they they're not bears. So we we do we're shaping things that are really easy and then going no oh, I've had really big success there and it's that's it isn't it? It's really reinforcing to us, which is why we do it yeah. rather than thinking actually these are the things that are really tough for me, like for Liddy stopping and making the decision before she she's Eric Cantona stopping and making a decision before she kicks somebody in the bite someone in the face that's her thing and that where I can get that tiny bit of gap between um, that explosive behavior that's where I can actually go well that was really good you offered me something different there like today a guy stopped and asked me where her house was and she you could see her and then switched the brain off for a bit and went all right you're just chatting okay and then she ran off and just smelled some smells yeah. um and that for me was the big thing but that is really hard for me to shape because yeah. I'm so used to telling her just sit there do this do that lie down here rather than giving her the space to make decisions for herself because she's always made such bad decisions but because um, you taught her those things and you've had to micromanage her just like I did with Ding then they learn the better choices hmm. and when you see them make a good choice then you've got something to reward yeah yeah um yeah. but I think that sometimes people trying to get that before all of the other steps first yeah 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 absolutely and like you said we're just shaping the things that are easy we're doing the things that are reinforcing the things that are easy for them to do yeah. um and then we're wondering why we're struggling Oh, it's like me going into a maths class and trying to teach maths. I would be disastrous at it, um, especially with a bunch of people who didn't know anything about maths any more than I did and really needed a really good teacher who understood what I was doing. Um, so probably that's a big part of it, isn't it? That yeah. we just, uh, we've got dogs who just fall naturally into the groove of the thing that they were designed to do and they've been selected to do for those behaviours and they love it and it's easy for us to get that. And then we're kind of going, well, I can't do any of these other things. But that's putting us to our test as uh, as trainers compared yeah. to and, and their test as well, which is why they get the we get the worst of them and they get the worst of us, don't they? Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Emma. I know that we could probably chat about this for hours, but um, <laughs> I really appreciate you giving us your time. Um, do you want to just tell people where they might be able to find you on the socials? 
you can find me all over I everywhere like a virus no I'm not. <laughs> I, <laughs> I am on lighten up dog training mainly and so you find my blogs there um I have a YouTube channel I don't post very much on um and mostly on Facebook because I'm of an age and that's about all I can manage um uh, so I'm not young and shiny anymore and I don't care uh, so mainly there <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you. And if you've enjoyed this chat, then please do subscribe to the YouTube channel um, for more chats coming up soon on breed specific things. <laughs>